So uh, this morning was pretty exciting. Uh, good conversations, good presentations. Uh, it reminds me, brings me back to when I was a kid, and I hate dating myself, but uh, 1984, my dad brought home an IBM PC with uh, two floppy drives in it. A friend gave me a uh, phone number to dial up, and I got connected to the world of bulletin board systems. And uh, there were all these people writing code, sharing it out there, and uh, forming this whole community. So it brings me right back to today in the, the open source community, and it's uh, you know, full of vibrancy and very exciting. So uh, what I want to talk to you today is about Bloomberg's journey in open data. Uh, I'll give a little background on what Figgy is, as well as uh, the journey we went through, the challenges, whatnot, and then a little look at the, the future and what the situation looks like today in open data standards and open source. So um, just generally the talk today, uh, you know, not going to, there's a lot of uh, talk about you know, reasons for open source. It's been well covered in previous conferences, uh, so I do want to give uh, credence to them about you know, the difference between core infrastructure and differentiators and having a latent self interest around that. Uh, I know uh, Russell from Deutsche Bank this morning had mentioned about how open source helps uh, reduce costs and also talent retention. Uh, I'll contrast that a little bit with open data later on. But Bloomberg's support for open source and open data, uh, we use GitHub and everything else. But also, we have things like we have two full time senior engineers supporting things like uh, Jupyter Lab Steering Council. So, Bloomberg's really behind uh, the, the open source and, and supporting the industry. Uh, so that extends into our work in open data. Take you back to 2010. Bloomberg had somewhat of a problem. If anybody's familiar with the Bloomberg systems uh, in the terminal, uh, there's these things called yellow keys. I've been at Bloomberg for five years now, and I actually avoided touching a Bloomberg until I came in. Uh, but there is actually, the yellow keys are basically broken up by asset class. 2010, each yellow key was its own data silo, own data model. Uh, it didn't really have much around standards, around identification. Tickers changed, which meant that the data model had to change. And uh, it just sort of made it difficult, if you have a single platform, like the terminal, to be able to share data and start to interoperate across it. Uh, so the goal was to look at creating a persistent permanent identifier that doesn't change, more of a framework as opposed to just a single identifier, so based around metadata and extensible, and that um, you know, would be able to go across asset classes, was not asset class dependent, uh, but really more like a framework model and a data model that could transverse the models within the uh, terminal and enable interoperability. Um, so. Next one. Um, if you think about a framework, uh, I, the, the biggest analogy I come up with is the uh, um, power systems that we have in the world, right? It'd be great if you could just go to another country, take all your appliances, and just plug them right in. But that's just, just not the way it works. Uh, and theoretically, it'd be great, but practically, it's not possible. Uh, there's an installed manufacturing base. Everybody has their hair dryers and appliances. You're not going to throw those away and buy brand new ones. Uh, so you come up with something like the power adapter. Uh, Chart IQ has this little block available, so definitely stop by their desk uh, because uh, I, I love that thing. Figgy, in the same way, uh, operates like this adapter across the identification framework. Identifiers have, there's thousands of them out there, whether they're tickers, QSIPs, ISINs, whatever you have. And they're all there for different purposes, but it's a many to one relationship or a one to many relationship in many times. And you're not going to get rid of systems that are based around ticker, let's say, because front office traders like tickers and they're embedded in old systems, legacy systems. You're not going to rip all that out. So the best way to make these things interoperate with each other is use an adapter, and, and Figgy operates that way. This is an example. Um, this is IBM Common Stock traded on New York Stock Exchange. That's the actual Figgy, so if you look that up, it'll pull up that data. That's just core 
data for us, right? It's just descriptive. It's not competitive advantage or anything else. There's nothing differentiating about it. Um, I described the model. So you'll notice that there's two other figgies. There's composite and there's global identifier. Uh, the composite, IBM's traded across the world on multiple exchanges within the US, 15 or so exchanges. So this, uh, the one that ends in 16 is just the New York Stock Exchange. There's 14 other ones. All of them reference this composite, which is the composite for the US. So it's specific just for the US on par with QSIP, which would settle at DTCC. But you can associate all those 15 exchanges and roll them up now. That same dynamic works across the world. There's five exchanges in Germany. There's an exchange in the UK, Europe, whatnot. And they all have their own composite by jurisdiction. They all roll up to the global level. So you're able to form a data model and associate all these things and preserve your other legacy identifiers, map them in metadata, and associate it. Great customer response. Of course, just like we talked about earlier in the day at other presentations, everybody's always worried about lock-in. Is Bloomberg going to pull this back after it's been open and free? Uh, general distrust of vendors. We have the whole uh, data problem with the exchanges that's going on today. Uh, so much like uh, Nima announced this morning about Alloy being provided out and decoupling it from Goldman, we did that 10 years ago with Figgy. We went to the Object Management Group, which is a technical standards consortium who has a lot of good experience in open data, Corbis standard, UML, other things. And we gave them the standard, went through their standardization process. We had already given it out underneath MIT open source, but that was actually baked into the standard when we went through the uh, standardization process with OMG. Sir? Yes? You say data problem with the exchanges. What do you mean by that? Uh, the questions today about it. The, in ESMA, right now they're looking at the charging that exchanges have. Uh, it, you can look up the news around it. Does that, you, you, does that answer your question? Yeah, there's just you know, lock-in, control, charging, all that kind of thing. So open data helps solve some of that problem. What we offer out is uh, Figgy, uh, openfiggy.com. Uh, anybody can access this. This is got all the data that's associated with Figgy, 650 million objects. That includes uh, inactive and active securities. Uh, there's two JSON APIs. Anybody can write to, you don't have to be a Bloomberg user. You don't have to even register on the website. You can pull the stuff from GitHub, hit the uh, API, and you'll be able to access this data. Now, open source versus uh, open data. Um, I say it's easier now to talk about open source and have a proposition against it. Code's demonstrable. Uh, you have GitHub. You can register it on GitHub. Uh, and as we've heard all through today, as well as previous presentations over the years, people are getting behind open source. Problem with data and open data is there's no GitHub for data, first of all. And a lot of talk around data nowadays is data is new oil, data is new water. So a lot of value is being attached to data no matter what it is. And there's a need to differentiate that, right? There is core reference information that is just description. Everybody has it. So why is that differentiator? It's not. This is the list of fields actually from the terminal that if you go fields open symbology, that's it. That's everything we offer open. It's all descriptive fields, name, description, security type, simple things, right? Differentiating, this is the description field in, uh, in the terminal. You have you know, all your, your price information, year to date, market values, caps, and all that kind of thing. There we go. So, as a firm that's going to be looking at open data and offering open data, what are the challenges you're going to have starting out, right? Um, just like open source, folks are going to worry about cannibalization. Are you giving things away for free? Uh, there is a cost to this. But as Russell had mentioned earlier, there's cost savings in working with open source, same as open data. 
Uh, are you giving a competitive advantage away? If it's core foundational data, there's no competitive advantage in that. It's commoditized. Everybody should be working off the same foundation. That's where you start creating differentiation. Next, today, once you've already made these arguments and you have this process going, someone's always going to come back and say, well, why are we doing that? Can it, it's very successful. Let's, let's do something else with it. So you have to stay the course, and you always have to continue to revise and renew your value proposition. Uh, as things become uh, more commoditized, you want to look at maybe expanding that set. Uh, so you always have the argument, is it cannibalization of current services, or is it more valuable to the industry as open source and open data? Uh, and there's still a cost. You always have to justify the cost. Qualitatively, you know, it's easy to dismiss that if you can't have those proper metrics. Quantitative is really hard to prove when you're giving things away. But when we come down to it, um, benefits mutual clients. Clients are going to buy data from multiple sources. Why make it hard for them to compare? By making it easy to compare across sources through open data, the value you really get to see. Who has the better prices? Who's better corporate action information? Who gives me better service? These are the things that are differentiating, not description. Um, benefit to the industry, you're, you're lowering barriers to entry. I don't know how many startups I've met, fintech firms, that I saw present at a conference. I wanted to talk to them about Figgy, and they said, oh, yeah, we already know about Figgy. We use it. That's how we started our business uh, from like Intrinio. Uh, a, a data vendor out of uh, Florida, they use Figgy. Uh, and it's what enabled them to create a reference data set to build their business off of. Lowering Bennett entries, increasing competition, forces you to increase quality, and just makes it better for the industry overall. Uh, internally, you'll, you're going to look at, you're not going to have to focus on that core reference anymore because it's shared. Now you can focus on what are new products I can have? Where can I interoperate with other service providers to provide more value for clients? And uh, I think it was Sherman this morning mentioned that uh, open source is a net positive for your reputation. Doing good is always doing good. So externally, what are the challenges you come up against? Well, for us, Bloomberg, you know, market leader, you're always going to be uh, pointing that. Uh, but, again, then, it was object management group. We gave it away to them. Still people say, oh, well, you're Bloomberg. Uh, you have to have that conversation. Competitors, can you get competitors to cooperate? Uh, I know the previous present, uh, presenter talked about his organization that looks to create competition, and, and uh, those kind of organizations are very useful for bringing people together to solve problems that are shared across the industry. And 10 years ago, there was confusion around that. You know, data was just something you stored in Oracle or Sybase. Who really cared about associations and data models and a lot of that kind of thing, especially from the business end. Today, it's still, you know, you, you still get, we can't apologize for being market leader and delivering value, but um, we are working with the industry. We work with, uh, U.S. standards and uh, organizations, we ISO uh, and Object Management Group to forward clauses of open data. Uh, competitors and other vendors, we have over 150 vendors that have adopted Figgy, have it in their feeds, send it out to their clients, exchanges, use it, uh, assign it on issuance. Uh, there's a page on the Open Figgy site you can check out the facilitators that we have there. Some are still on the sideline, hoping they join up as well. Uh, but um, one point of success is that users now want more to fray, <laughs> more for free. Uh, so you still have to look at and say, you know what, there's a differentiated value here, and you have to be able to explain that uh, use case to the users. So the reality is competition is good. Uh, choice enables and helps the industry. Uh, the other thing is lock-in. 
Why compete on lock-in when you compete on quality? That's where the, the value is for your firm in delivering to clients and also for the industry and the clients receiving that data. You do have to address the slowly, uh, slowly sliding scale uh, where this is as things become commoditized, you should be focusing on things that create more value. Create more value on the other end, expand that value proposition here, and as things come commoditized, you can open those things up for open data and add it to, uh, add it to what you're offering. Uh, there's value in services. Uh, Linux is free. Red Hat provides services on top of it to make it easy for you. So those are the things that a value add on top of uh, open. Problem is, people are jumping on the bandwagon. Misuse of open. Lots of standards organizations out there. Uh, just because it's a standard doesn't mean that's open. Even you can't qualify by a standards organization. So somebody like ISO. Just because it's ISO doesn't mean it's open. Doesn't mean it's not open. So 2022 was mentioned in the previous uh, uh, discussion as well. Swift in its management of 2022, it's open. Bunch of other standards within uh, that TC68 are not. Others are. So currency code, country code, those are open. Um, when you assume a standard is open and it's not, you can get locked in because of licensing restrictions. Cost recovery and RAND, reasonable and non-discriminatory, are not audited by any standards organization that allows it. Uh, I know of cases of 200% markup on a standard. Uh, so being aware of that, uh, proprietary is used as a derogatory term a lot of times, but there's a lot of proprietary things out there that are actually standards, open, eh, and have a large community behind them. Uh, FPML and FIX, some people keep on calling them proprietary, they're not. They're community-based standards. Providers sometimes misuse open in order to get on the bandwagon. So looking at how they operate, that's important to look at. Sometimes they'll say you can use the identifier, but you have to buy the description. Or after 500 uses, then I'm going to start charging you. Or uh, you can use it, but you have to buy it as part of this bundle. That to me is not open data. Open data is you can go somewhere, do a search, get APIs, get real data, in a workflow without having to do screen scrapes or anything else, or pay a license fee. Regulators are helpful and still need some education. Like I said, standards, uh, regulators have bought into standards. They bought, bought into open. They're confused still about that difference between standards doesn't mean open. Um, by mandates, they're trying to get people to adopt standards, which is a good thing in theory. But if you mandate something, that creates lock-in, especially if there's licensing and restrictions around that standard. Now you've created a regulatory compulse monopoly, which is not good for the industry. It's not good for innovation. Creates friction in the marketplace and introduces a high level of cost to the market. Um, one of the reasons, uh, so Burn on his talk about C++ this morning mentioned, uh, everybody wants to make C++ more simple, but you can't, right? That's just silly. Uh, but you can try and organize it. Regulators are facing the same sort of challenge with financial services, where they, uh, financial services is naturally complex, and they're thinking, oh, well, we'll standardize it, and that'll get rid of complexity. No, because different communities speak different languages. And you can't standardize away complexity. You can organize it, but you can't standardize it away. Uh, fixed income desk, equity desk, two different languages. Sure, they have some overlap in some things, but they definitely have different cultures and different languages that they speak. So you have to look at creating standards specific to communities and allow choice and openness. Great thing about standards is that there's so many. That's always a, a great line. Um, Usually said with derision, I think it's a good thing. If you look at standards and when people say these standards are competing with each other, I would posit that they are not. 
They are likely built for different communities. They have different needs. They're similar, but they're different. That's where I go. Silos are not a bad thing. Silos are a naturally occurring phenomenon. They are shared culture, shared process. That's why silos exist, because they have a shared culture and shared process. You gain efficiencies out of that. You should look at focusing your standards on those silos and then figure out how to interoperate between the silos, not collapse them. I don't know how many efforts I've been through where fixed income and equity were merged together or global custody and domestic custody were merged together. And two, three years later, they were ripped back apart because it didn't work. Because everybody's looking for a silver bullet. Silver bullets only kill werewolves, not vampires. Right? You need the solution for the community you're dealing with. One thing is not going to solve all your problems. People need to understand this. In standards, standard does not mean homogenizing across everything. Standards are used to prevent competition through lock-in. Someone owns a standard, and they have licensing, and they can charge for it. They convince the regulators that, oh, we're a standard. It gets mandated. Now the industry is stuck with that, and they can't use anything else. They don't have choice. They can't innovate. And they have cost. So in closing, um, open data I don't think is at risk yet. However, there's things we need to think about. Um, open data in the public sector is coming under fire. You see open data from the government closing up. Um, open data in the private sector, it's difficult. Open data, just like open source, has to start with the market leaders. But there's some distrust in the market leaders. Uh, I think it was Russell also who said that without community, open source will die. So that's what we're looking for in open data, is more people to join the community and support these efforts. You prevent lock-in. You create innovation. You lower barriers to entry for new firms, individuals, uh, programmers that need access to data in order to do their work and come up with innovative ideas. And every community is different. So embracing standards and differences uh, and not standardizing or trying to homogenize everybody, but embrace those differences. Adopt standards appropriate for those communities and make them interoperate together. Don't make them all act the same. Um, I have two minutes or so left. And I promised Jim Northey, who's next, that I wouldn't run over on him. <laughs> I wonder if you could say more about uh, open data in the public sector being under fire. No, I mean, it, it, you'll see open data sets. Uh, you know, if the government's budget doesn't support it, then you know, it's not going to stay out there, right? Um, that's not just in the US. I'm just talking globally, that uh, budgetary pressures, everything else, it, it's our money that funds it as taxes, but that gets allocated somewhere else. Uh, if, oh, I would think so. I, I, I think it's priority, right? If other priorities are seen and the value of open data is not understood, which right now I don't think it is understood within financial services or even globally. Um, I mean, I'm a surfer. I love NOAA because, I mean, Based on NOAA's data, I can go and find forecasts for when I need to go. And especially being in Jersey, it's very variable. But using NOAA data, you can find out, right? Um, if that wasn't available, uh, it, it's not just for me. It's for ship it, shipments, uh, logistics, and everything else depends upon that. And if we don't keep sight of that, then you can lose some of these open data sources. Up top. Well, it's, I would say you can't move off of legacy identifiers completely. Well, so there are particular legacy systems and everything else. Not looking at eliminating anything, but making it more sensible for when you should use something. Um, how you want to move off it, it depends on how you're going to work on your infrastructure. It's a lot of implementation. Um, Figgy helps you navigate between the different identifiers that are there. So 
hopefully offering a little bit more choice around what you can use. Um, and if regulatory uh, regimes, industry infrastructure and whatnot also adopted choice, then you would have the choice to pick what works for you. I, mean, I come from a, a custodian bank background, uh, Bank of Trust, Bank of New York, and yeah, I love CEDAW because you know, I could determine which jurisdiction and place a settlement. Uh, actually, so Bloomberg does support op open data in Entity. We are a LOU, a legal op uh, local operating unit for the LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier, for, uh, which is an ISO standard. And uh, so we offer that out uh, through the association with the Glyph on our uh, LOU website. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. We want to support the the industry's efforts around legal entity, and as an open data standard, uh, LEI has potential there. So, we, I mean, we're making a lot of efforts in, especially in Asia and, and other markets where you haven't had as much take up. Oh yeah, um, I'm over. So, uh, thank you very much, and. Uh, Enjoy the rest of the conference.